evening. I'm Peter Woolley. I'm professor of comparative politics, and I have the good fortune of serving as provost on this campus called the College at Florham. I'm delighted to welcome His Excellency, uh, who will be introduced in a moment, and I'm delighted to welcome Ambassador Kamal, our old friend, who is always uh, not only well informed but uh, interesting and entertaining at the same time. Uh, this is uh, this is an excellent program. I, you should tell your friends about it. Uh, it's not the only excellent program on this campus. I'm just going to remind those of you who are new that uh, we also have uh, the Literary Review hosted on this campus, which is an international magazine featuring uh, four Guggenheim winners uh, in the past year. Uh, we have the FDU Press on this campus, which is uh, a university press putting out 30 to 35 scholarly titles a year. And we have the truly unique WAMFest, Words and Music Festival, uh, every year, including next week, which will culminate in the Poet Laureate of the United States uh, actually performing his poetry with a jazz trio. And as we all know, jazz is an international language. Uh, so on that note, uh, I welcome you again to the UN Pathways program, the Ambassadors Forum. And my good colleague, John Scheman, will do the introductions. As Peter said, my name is John Scheman. I'm an associate professor also of comparative politics and chair of the Department of Social Sciences and History on the Madison campus. And I'd like to welcome you to the, our first UN Pathways uh, lecture event of the, of the year. Um, we don't have to look any further than the uh, presidential debates last night and the back and forth about immigration to uh, recognize how important Mexico is to, to even to domestic politics in the United States. Of course, Mexico-U.S. relations and Mexico's importance in the region is, is much larger, much more important uh, than just that narrow uh, lens that we often hear of, uh, of immigration. Uh, we are therefore very pleased to welcome His Excellency Luis Alfonso de Alba Gongora, the permanent representative of Mexico to the United Nations. Ambassador Gongora has led a distinguished professional diplomatic career that's uh, listed on your, on your handout. I won't, I won't go through it all. It would take far too long. Um, but we are indeed lucky to have him here tonight to provide us with some of these insights about Mexico. I will say I'm not so sure that, Professor, that the ambassador rather will feel the same way, that is to say, uh, lucky to be here because the, the program this evening will take the form of a conversation between uh, Ambassador Kamal and, uh, and, and, and the ambassador from, from Mexico. And Ambassador Kamal, former permanent representative of Pakistan to the, to the UN, president of the UN uh, Ambassadors Club, uh, is known to make PhD qualifying exams look like a uh, kindergarten playground compared to the grilling he gives our, our the ambassadors who come here. It's a wonder that they, he still can get them to come. Uh, so uh, uh, without further, any further ado then, I would like to turn it over to Ambassador Kamal and Ambassador Gungara. Thank you very much. Ambassador uh, Alfonso de Alba, uh, welcome to Fairleigh Dickinson. Uh, this is a university which is close to the United Nations because it has really been doing extraordinary work in collaboration with the United Nations on a number of issues, including outreach into students, including uh, the, the academic uh, impact concept which originated in this university and was then picked up by the Secretary General. And, and so the Secretary General himself came here and was duly honored with an honorary doctorate. And so this is a part of the system of the United Nations. And so you are both at the university and also at home here. Uh, I wanted to ask you a number of questions, but let me start with the most difficult one, which constantly confuses me. The Mexico, Mexico is a, an important neighbor of the United States. Uh, it is, uh, in fact, 
it is a part of the United States because large parts of the, Uni of the United States are really uh, Mexican portions uh, picked up by the Americans through war. And so uh, I th you, you, you have a, 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 a legitimate interest in the United States and in feeling that this is a country uh, which should know you better. But the fact of the matter is that despite your closeness and despite your common history, the only thing that the United States really knows about Mexico is about Mexican immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States is convinced that all Mexicans are learning how to swim across the Rio Grande. And that's it. So Mexico is just swimmers across the Rio Grande. But there is much more to Mexico. Surely, you are a country with a very old history and an established history. And I'm going to ask you about that history. But my first question to you is, you are one of the most respected countries in the United Nations, the most respected country, because I can tell you as an outside observer that Mexico floats through the uh, elections for the Security Council whenever it chooses to do so. 50 year, uh, 100, uh, 70 years ago, you decided not to fight for those elections. Mm -hmm. And you voluntarily stayed out. But the minute you change your mind, you floated through. And you float through because people will all vote for you. And so you are highly loved in the United Nations. But I don't find that degree of love reciprocated in the United States. Why is that so? Well, let me, let me start by thanking you, Ambassador Kamal, and the university, Fairly Dixon. Dick, Dickinson, sorry, and apologize because of my English. Uh, pronunciation included, but I, I, I welcome very much the opportunity to have this dialogue uh, this afternoon with all of you, and uh, particularly because of the very kind introduction that, in which you highlighted that I'm at home and, uh, and that you, you care about uh, international issues, you care about the United Nations, and I think that's, uh, that's quite important. Uh, I welcome the opportunity also because it allowed me precisely to address some of the issues that you just uh, mentioned. Uh, how come that uh, being so close we are so far away? We know each other so little and particularly from one side to the other, from the US side to the Mexican side. How do we simplify history so frequently or even ignore history and, and look into the issues like uh, migration as if it was the only one? The uh, image of the swimming that you evoke is, is, uh, is a very painful one for us. Uh, remember the, the term wetbacks. Uh, all Mexicans are wetbacks. Uh, that, that was uh, the, 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 the way we were described. And people forget that uh, a large part of the United States used to be Mexican territory. Two million square meters. That's a little bit the same as the size of the country. It means that Mexico was twice as big as it is today. And certainly, there are different processes by which uh, territory has passed. War was one of them, not the only one, because at least in the case of Texas, uh, there was a different process. Uh, uh, you promoted uh, an independent state first, and then annex uh, or provoke a, a self-determination exercise in Texas. But, but I, I don't want to get too deep into the history, and especially because I, I don't want to highlight the negatives, but how we have been able to manage some of those negatives and, and move on. Because uh, the, the most important point I want to make is that knowing each other so little, we should not forget that we are neighbors, and we cannot change that, that uh, we have 3,000 kilometers, which may be around 2,000 miles, or 2,000 and something miles of border, and a lot of common uh, interest. You ask the question, how, 
come that uh, we we have such a strong presence in the international uh, uh, field, and particularly the UN, and and probably not that much in the in the US. And the answer I would say is relatively easy to understand. Mexico has a history, a very long history and a, a tradition, uh, without any offense to the U.S., but much uh, longer than, than the U.S. We come from a pre-Hispanic uh, civilization that we value very much. And, and that part, if I make a parenthesis, is one of the parts that it is very much valued in the U.S. It's the indigenous heritage of Mexico. People like to go to Mexico to visit the pyramids and, and, and witness the uh, traditional ceremonies, etc. But but they forget that this is part of our own understanding of life, uh, the transition between the indigenous, the Spanish conquest, and the mixture. And uh, we are a much complex society in that sense than the, than the United States, because it's a longer history and a longer effort of uh, merging two different uh, cultures and, and two different ways of understanding. It implies merging of uh, uh, traditions, it implies a coexistence of religions, uh, to, which you have uh, obviously the Catholic Church, uh, which is the predominant in Mexico by far. We are talking about uh, probably 90, 95 percent of the population that uh, may be Catholic, but they still practice a lot of uh, rituals and, 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 and ceremonies coming from the, 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 the time of the, the the Aztecs or the, 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 the indigenous groups in different parts in, uh, of the region. So this complexity of our own history has teach us uh, a number of values that uh, are very, very close to the values that uh, we, we have at the United Nations. So, uh, uh, don't forget that uh, since the middle of uh, the uh, 19th century, a little more than the, we have uh, one of the wars that we have uh, was against the French uh, uh, because the French invaded us also. The president at that time has a slogan. It's a slogan which is written at the entrance of the General Assembly, uh, which is uh, difficult. Uh, my English is not so good to translate, but Victor may help me, uh, which is el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz. The, the, the respect to the... The respect for human rights uh, is the same as peace. Or the respect to the, it's not to human rights, it's to the others, to anybody else. The is peace, is the, is the basis for peace. And, and Mexico has been, because of the wars, because of its own tradition, has been very much pushing for that approach, that uh, we need, we need uh, uh, to base our relations and our development on, on coexistence and peace. And we participated very actively in the negotiations first of the Society of Nations, the League of Nations, and, and then the creation of the United uh, Nations. And if you look into the charter and the principles of peaceful solution of disputes, and, and etc., the rule of law, respect of international law, etc., those are the same values on which we have based our uh, international relation and our behavior. Uh, with the U.S., we have developed a, a, a very complex uh, relationship uh, and just to make the contrast, uh, while you push for uh, peaceful use and, 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 and uh, self-determination and respect of uh, minorities and uh, human rights, uh, rights of uh, persons with disabilities, etc., at the same time you have to, to have uh, 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 some kind of positioning on, on a number of international conflicts and, and the, the, the use of nuclear weapons, uh, the strategic... Uh, maneuvering of the, the, the powerful countries, and then we enter into conflict with the U.S. because our vision is, is, is very much a, vis a vision of peace and a, and a, a vision of, on which we, we don't have the military means or the, the ambition to, 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 to be, um, uh, to, to, to dominate. And the U.S. has a different role to play at the United Nations. It's not always negative. Sometimes it is a role that it is unavoidable. But in any case, it's a, it's a different role. It's the role of a superpower. So that's the beginning of a difference. Whether one country is trying to build uh, what I would like, uh, call kind of a, a common understandings and, and, and institutions and rules that will uh, be useful for all countries, which is our approach, 
or whether you have to defend some of your immediate interests, uh, as it is frequently the case in the US. Ambassador, I can empathize totally with what you are saying, because I come from Pakistan, mm -hmm. which is, like Mexico, a large country, but with a very large neighbor, mm -hmm. which is 11 times bigger and more powerful. And so we know the concept of the big brother mm -hmm. across the border. Uh, but you have successfully managed, much more successfully than Pakistan, you have managed to have uh, a relationship with the United States. Uh, part of it is because of the migration from Mexico into the United States, because you, your migrants uh, are more virile and produce more children. And so you are slowly winning the Mexican war uh, in the 21st century uh, without firing a bullet. And that is very good. Uh, I find that a lot of Mexican girls, as soon as they get pregnant, they come to the United States because they want their baby to be born mm -hmm. here. Uh, that gives them uh, uh, a right of American citizenship. So all this is very good, mm -hmm. uh, extremely wise on your part. But nevertheless, uh, you have a relationship because the economics of the two countries are tied into each other. Mm -hmm. uh, Mexico is uh, a hard-working country with lower wages. The United States is quote-unquote hard-working, but with high wages. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, there is an obvious, uh, obvious temptation mm -hmm. to outsource mm -hmm. production into Mexico. Uh, NAFTA made that easier. Now, I want your views on NAFTA, because most people, uh, you had on one side Ross Perot, who was a presidential candidate, who said there'll be a whooshing sound and all American jobs will automatically go into Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, that did not happen. US production is stable. Mm -hmm. In Mexico, I find that there are two opinions about NAFTA. One opinion sees it as beneficial mm -hmm. for the economy, and the other opinion says, no, it has created maquiladores on the border, and in that process, it has created more poverty in Mexico. Where is the truth? Is NAFTA good or is it bad for Mexico? And by NAFTA, I mean, the economic relationship between the between Mexico and the United States. Well, let, let me let me address first the the, the issue of migration, uh, uh, at least briefly. I think, as you mentioned, we, it know, has, we know that yeah. you produce more yeah. children than the Americans yeah, well, do. That, that's a fact. That's that's, that's part of it. <laughs> that's part of it. Uh, obviously, uh, the 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 the. the, the the rate of uh, the, 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 the in which the, the Mexican community is growing allow us to talk about a Pacific reconquest uh, uh, of some areas. Uh, we have a, a number of officials already, mayors and congressmen uh, from Mexican origin, and it's obviously uh, something that should help us to, to a better understanding because uh, our influence into into uh, not only politics but economics and. and, and cultural life in the, in the U.S. Uh, has to benefit. Unfortunately, the Mexican community, uh, the Mexican community in the U.S. And, and even locally by regions is not as united as it should. It's not so, so clear that it is playing the role at, that it could play, but it is important. But uh, what I wanted to highlight when it comes to migration is that there is a, 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 an effort uh, which we have not been yet as, as successful as we should to understand that it is mutually beneficial. That it's not only the Mexicans that are crossing because they can have their babies here and a better life or a better salary, but that the U.S. is benefiting a lot of the migrants that are coming because they are bringing 
in some cases lab, uh, cheap labor, but in some other cases also cultural values and, and cult uh, family values, and they are very hard working, and they are doing a lot of jobs that are not being done by Americans. And in some cases, they are very successful uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, there is an example which is close to, to this area, but if you are interested, there is a, a wonderful uh, case of uh, 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 somebody from Puebla who came with uh, no dollars, no, no pesos on it in his pocket, and, and he started a, a factory uh, producing tortillas. And today is the biggest producer of tortillas worldwide. It's the, the single company that produces more tortillas than anybody else, uh, uh, either in the US or Mexico. Uh, he has been able to bring more than half of his hometown to work for him, and that's a business in Queens. Uh, with, the, with the millions of tortillas produced uh, daily, but it's not the only case. We, we have a, a number of architects, a number of uh, artists that are coming, but making the case that we both benefit of, uh, of a migration is, is quite important. Coming to NAFTA, uh, I think NAFTA certainly helped both countries, three countries, Canada included, uh, by uh, allowing a, 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 an increased flow of trade and, and certainly capacity to produce certain products partially in each of the countries and assemble most of the, uh, the products or many of the products in Mexico, uh, benefiting of the maquiladoras, we call the ship labor and the, and the border. But not only that, uh, uh, by through NAFTA, the, the US and Canada also realized that uh, Mexico is a market of 100 and 10 million people with a middle class in the rise. Uh, and, 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 and if you look into the numbers of the companies which are doing business, in uh, American companies doing business in Mexico, you will see that there is a huge amount of money which is linked there. Uh, we have become at some point the second uh, trade partner of the, the US, not only the relationship between what Mexico export, but what the Americans export to, to Mexico. And that helped to understand. But it is true that uh, we uh, developed this uh, free trade agreement with, uh, with some, I would say, deficiencies or loopholes. One of them is labor market. There was no exchange of labor market there. And the other one is that uh, the transfer of technology was quite uh, limited. Uh, it was. Um, a process which did not allow many companies, particularly on the Mexican side, to innovate and to develop and, uh, the, the, the technology that they were uh, being able to use through some, some parts of the, the agreements. Not at the, the rate, certainly, as other uh, Asian countries have been able to do it, for instance. And we have not realized also that uh, all of this had some sense not only in the regional context, but in the global context. Uh, and uh, whatever doubts the Americans had about losing jobs or sending abroad the, 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 the labor they, they, they may need it here, uh, has happened even more with China and, and other countries, other regions of the world, because the, 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 the way things work today uh, in a globalized world uh, does not allow any country to, to continue to, to to work on the basis of uh, keeping the borders closed. So uh, what I would say is that uh, the impact for those, uh, you, you divided those who are in agreement and those who are against, I, I will tell you that that's true to some extent, but we are converging to the point on which we all recognize that it has been positive to some extent, uh, mainly, but it has also, or it needs also, kind of a revision on a, on, on a new impetus. It's not moving further. And uh, uh, I think if you talk about people, and now we went through a political exercise in Mexico by uh, selecting a new president, and you will see all three main parties. None of them uh, spoke against NAFTA uh, and, and regret NAFTA, but all of them were talking about a new stage of the relationship a new way in which uh, Mexico will need to, 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 to base its own development. We are talking about the transfer, transformation that will pay much more attention than the one we have been able to do, uh, to, 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 uh, to do.
to until now on issues of uh, education, for instance. This is a, a pending issue in Mexico. We have invested a lot on education, and we still have one of the worst education systems in the world. Uh, the issues of corruption, uh, the unions, uh, the, the, the level of uh, preparedness of uh, teachers, etc., is, is a huge problem. The, the volume of investment on science and technology is not uh, sufficient for, for the transformation we are trying to, to achieve. So we need to understand that we need to do a lot of things internally to be able to benefit more uh, whenever we go into uh, the international arena. Mexico continues to be one of the biggest exporters in, in the world. Probably, uh, I don't know exactly now, but we may be the seven or eight largest exporter. We export more than all Latin America together. And that includes Brazil. If you take the exports of Brazil and all other Latin American countries, it's less than the Mexican export. But if you look into those exports, you will see that most of it comes from American companies, or companies which have, uh, uh, not only Americans, but uh, foreign companies who have invested, whether we are talking, and it's one of the main products we sport cars, for instance, uh, all of those cars are, are uh, from other companies, there is no Mexican car. Uh, so uh, an analysis on, on, on the future, which will value NAFTA, but will try to, to go one step further I think it is it is what uh, what I would like to to suggest. Uh, on uh, well, just one idea about migration before we shift to a different subject. In the United Nations, uh, when we examined the concept of migration, we found that it w one of the odd things was that in a world where odd borders are eroding. Mm -hmm. Money can move without any uh, obstacles, mm -hmm. but human beings cannot move because there are obstacles. Mm -hmm. And so it's very funny that your, your pocket can go across the border, but you need a passport and a visa and a, and a restriction against your movement. And how is it that we don't worry about human beings uh, uh, <laughs> but we worry about human beings, but not about their money. But that being said, uh, there is another aspect about uh, Mexico which is uh, troubling. Mm -hmm. And that is the amount of violence in the country. Mm -hmm. Either because it's related to drugs or because it is related to crime, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, trafficking of uh, of uh, different of both of drugs and of women, mm -hmm. and so uh, the United States, as you know, is worried about this. And in yesterday's debate, it came up in the references to Fast and Furious. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, why is Mexico, with a country with that longer history, and that richer history? Why should you be such a violent society? Why should you be involved in drugs? Is it because you consume drugs or because that is one of your major exports to the United States? Uh, because the United Neither. States wants to buy your drugs because they are good quality Mexican drugs. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a little bit of everything and not necessarily uh, true in other ways. I'm not talking about the quality of the drugs because I have not had the opportunity <laughs> to try and I will not give an expert opinion on it. But uh, I no. can testify to the quality of the beauty of your women at least. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, for, well, let me, let me say something which probably for you is, is going to sound a little bit uh, strange. The level of violence in Mexico is not higher than the level of violence in most of Latin American countries. The difference, the big difference, is that it in Mexico is very visible. And it is very visible because the government has decided to enter openly, drastically, in a war with crime. But if you look, if you look into the number of people being kidnapped, being killed, being robbed, in Brazil, you will see that the numbers are higher uh, in most of the cities. So the, the main issue is not whether we are violent, it's whether 
we are able to control the level of violence, which is already too high, even in forgetting the comp comparison with others. And what are the reasons why the violence became so so visible and so so uh, I would say so painful? Because it is not just violence; it is with it is with a level of uh, um, I don't know how to say it in English of so uh, cruelty in some cases which which shocks the, the whole society and and the answer is is a mixture of all the the, the, the elements you gave uh, mexico is a producer of some drugs but not the main producer it's mainly a traffic uh, country of traffic of uh, drugs Most Trans of transit tra drugs trucks in transit but it certainly produces a few and it's increasingly consuming drugs, which is something which worries us very much. And the, the increase in the consumption has to do with the increase of the income of the, the, the society, the middle class, and, and etc. So there is a phenomenon which is very linked uh, to, the, to the capacity of the country. It's ironic, but the better you do, the most uh, possibilities you have to increase the consumption. But historically, it has been mainly a transit country and it has been uh, uh, suffering the policies of the United States on that, that regard. On the first level, the US did not recognize that there was a direct linkage of offer and demand. Uh, believe it or not, we went in, uh, into negotiation. Look at the convention, it's, I think it is the 68th convention on drugs, which doesn't talk about uh, consumption. It talks about production and it talks about trafficking. It was until the 90s, uh, I think it was 96, 98, uh, when we had a high level meeting at the General Assembly that we were able to adopt a document talking about the interrelationship of production, traffic, and consumption. And then the policies to, to reduce uh, uh, consumption, the, the uh, uh, Actions, uh, not only from a, from a, a law enforcement uh, or, or police uh, uh, angle, but, but rather from a preventive, from a uh, uh, health approach, uh, reducing addictions, how do you say addiction? Addiction. Uh, was, it's quite recent. Uh, now you, you listen to politicians in the US, and President Obama has been one of the, the, the most open about that, uh, referring to the responsibility of the U.S. to reduce consumption, and and that that is quite recent. So that's one of the the, the, the reasons. The other reason uh, we suffer is is not only because of these policies, but because of the link that they the traffic in drugs uh, has with with uh, with arms, and the fact that the U.S. has been absolutely unable to control the the the, 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 the this. Access to the weapons, and, and we are not talking about access to, to small pistols, or we are talking about automatic weapons and high-caliber weapons. You have so many points of sale in the border of the Mexico, the U.S. You couldn't imagine. It's one of the biggest business that you can imagine. People may go on vacation to Mexico for one week or two weeks, and they can they can pay their travel their travel by smuggling one or two guns and selling it to the black market. So if you add that to the, to the, to the corruption, which is very much linked to the, to the police in several areas, on both sides of the, 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 the border, we need to be, to be candid. The, the corruption is not exclusive to Mexico. It may be bigger, it, it may be more visible, but corruption at this level is heavy. Otherwise, how do you explain the distribution of drugs across the United States? Uh, if they cross the border, there is participation already of some, some officials on this side, and for the distribution, there is certainly participation of a greater number. But coming back to the question of the small arms, uh, or uh, arms, firearms, uh, it was only uh, in a meeting, uh, and it's a very interesting meeting, a meeting that took place between President Clinton by the end of his, his mandate, it says, and, and president, second mandate, and president Cedillo at the time, that it was fully recognized this linkage. Before that, it was denied. Uh, through this meeting, it, it was very interesting because there was a, we were trying to push for a convention to prohibit the 
production and, and the trafficking of uh, firearms and ammunition. And the Americans were very reluctant to enter it. They were complaining about uh, uh, the process, and, and they were basically saying that there was uh, nothing wrong, that there the, the, the were two different issues. Uh, one was fighting crime, and the other one was uh, dealing with arms, including the right of uh, citizens to possess and, and, and use the weapons, and we should not mix, etc. You, you know more or less the argument. But when it came to the bilateral uh, dialogue, President Clinton told uh, President Cedillo, in short, that uh, the Constitution, that the policies in the U.S. did not allow him to go very far. He could only commit to help Mexico at the border level, that he will make an effort at the border to screen and, and to train some of the Mexican uh, uh, custom officials, etc. So cooperation will be at the border level. That was the, 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 the big gesture. And President Cedillo at that time uh, thanked President Clinton and said, well, it's not what I expected, but it is something from you. I'm, I'm getting something. Just let, let me be very clear. I will commit to do exactly the same, no more, no less, when it comes to drugs. I will limit my cooperation to the border. President Clinton immediately realized that he could not accept that kind of deal. And we entered into a negotiation of a convention. And we finishing within one year, we finish a convention on which we commit to mark the weapon, we commit to ex exchange information at the, uh, from the production to the, to the export, uh, from uh, any police activity, seize of uh, arms, etc. Unfortunately, that convention has never been ratified by the United States. It's still there. It's a convention. No, of it, cannot, it cannot be ratified for a very simple reason. There are 535 members of Congress in the United States. Not one of them who does not have a major military industrial complex in his constituency. Mm -hmm. And so there is no way you can get mm -hmm. this. Uh, through the U.S. Congress. Uh, you must be realistic about it. But I wanted to ask you a slightly different question. At the U.N., you have the United Nations Office for Drugs and Crime. When they examined Afghanistan, because Afghanistan produces 80% of the world's heroin, 80% mm -hmm. comes from one country. And they found that Afghanistan was growing poppy which is the mother uh, crop from which you make heroin. And the reason was that if you grow poppy and make it into heroin, you earn about $1,000 from each acre of land. Whereas if you grow onions and wheat, you earn only $10 per mm -hmm. acre of land. Mm -hmm. And so the farmers have a major incentive in not growing onions and salad and wheat, but of growing poppies, because the income is 100 times more immediately. Do you have this problem in, the, in Mexico? Are there poor farmers who are growing uh, the, the crops from which uh, drugs are made uh, because uh, it produces more income for them? Without any, any doubt, I think it is a, a problem everywhere. It is much more visible when it, you, you look into the situation in Colombia or in Peru because of the, the growth uh, of um, heroin the, and, okay. and, and, and cocaine and, and, and marijuana, but, but also in Mexico. But let me, let me go further. Is, you have two issues you need to be concerned. One is the huge volume of benefit in doing this, this kind of business that needs to be reduced. Otherwise, uh, there is no way you can, you can ask a, a, a farmer not to produce uh, drugs uh, and, and to have an alternative uh, product to, to, to cultivate. But there is, there is also the, 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 the problem of penalizing or putting the, the focus on a smaller producers. Sometimes you have a, a, a patient which is producing a few meters or 
not even a hectare or a, we call it a acre. And they go to jail. But then you have uh, some people doing that business very productively, very sophisticatedly, and, and with the, even the assistance of technicians, etc., doing it in California uh, legally. So we need to, 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 to be consistent. Uh, we cannot uh, put the, 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 the weight of the, the, the law and, and bring people to jail when we are talking about very poor people, which is facing this uh, dilemma of uh, uh, producing one or, or another product, and then allowing, allowing the production of the same product uh, in, in California. This is an issue we, which uh, President Calderon just raised during the past General Assembly. Mm. He made a very strong appeal at the General Assembly. First, to look into ways and means to reduce the benefits of uh, the cartels, because the kind of benefit, uh, the, the amount of money they can get uh, in this business uh, will always incentivate production and trafficking. There is no way we will stop it. If you achieve some success in Mexico in, in blocking the, 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 or reducing production or blocking the, the transit, uh, it, it will come from somewhere else. It will come through the Caribbean or through the Central America, or it, it will go directly from, it will come directly from Afghanistan or any other country because it is so attractive that uh, something needs to be done. And we also need to look into the, the question of uh, whether we uh, criminalize or penalize all activities, all products so all together, or we start a serious discussion on a gradual approach uh, and, and, and try to diminish. Uh, some people is talking already even about uh, legalizing some of, some of the, 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 the drugs. The president of uh, Guatemala made the case also at the General Assembly. Some other uh, very famous uh, personalities, both in the US side and the Mexican side, are arguing. And President Calderon suggested that at least we should discuss. What we need to be very much aware, both the US, Mexico, and other countries, is that the strategy we have followed has failed. That's a fact. Because the, 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 the volume of production and consumption of drugs continues to be and, and too high and unmanageable, and the linkage with the, with the fight law. Let me also come back a little bit with the most recent phenomenon in Mexico. Some, there is one issue which uh, the Colombians explained to us very carefully, and we didn't understood it fully at the beginning, and, and I, I have the feeling that it is not understood in the US also. Whenever you have big lords, big drug lords, and you are successful in, in fighting them, the immediate consequence is an increase in violence and an increase on, 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 on criminals. Because once you, you start, you have seven or ten very huge organizations, very visible, but once you kill or uh, arrest uh, two, three, or five of them, you will have at least four or five out of each of those groups splitting. And, and that's exactly what uh, have happened in Mexico. It's not that we have uh, more criminal activity, but we have mu much more criminals uh, in terms of uh, uh, smaller organizations. It may be a, sim a signal that the fight is producing some results. It's not necessarily that the war is being lost, but it, it is a, 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 a consequence of the, the success. But then there is a second problem. It's not only the spread of the, the, the criminal activity, there is also the problem that as you go to a lower number of people dealing with this and a lower level of income, then it becomes attractive not only to transport the, the drug and to do the transit from one place to another so that the drug can get into the US. It becomes attractive to link it with kidnapping and with uh, extortion and the criminal organizations, which were not necessarily linked with the drug uh, the trafficking, get very mixed with the, with the drug cartels. And that makes also very difficult because now we have problems of uh, extreme violence at the very local level, very small organizations which are, which are taking the, the stage and, 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 and producing fear in the population. So it is, it is a fight that is going to be Unfortunately, for a few years, it's not going to end. Uh, and uh, what we can do, and what the 
incoming president or the elected president has, has uh, highlighted is the need to, to continue the, the, the fight, but adjusting the strategy. And the, the adjustment, and just to, because I don't want to, to speak too much about that, the, the, the adjustment, we hope that it will come first from a, an international debate on the issue, because we cannot deal with this issue alone. We need the international community to be honest and to do a serious analysis of the situation, to develop new approaches, new strategies to fight uh, with it. And secondly, from the inside, we need to put much more emphasis on the preventive uh, side. We need to put much more emphasis on the intelligence work and less in the participation of the army, uh, which was indispensable under the circumstances on which we, we face uh, this, this problem at the beginning, but which will not uh, be a longer term solution. The military people has to go back to the... To the I have one last question to ask before we open to the floor for questions from the floor. Um, you are a much respected and much loved ambassador at the United Nations. And you are a very serious mission. Uh, you are the only mission that I know uh, where you can telephone the mission at 7 o'clock in the evening and the diplomats are still working. Uh, which means that you must be a tyrant yourself uh, the, because uh, your diplomats are obviously very scared of you. Uh, I could never get my diplomats to work till seven in the evening. <clears throat> but what are, if you can give me just the top three areas of primary interest for Mexico at the United Nations, what are the top three priorities for you at the UN? Oh, that's the most difficult question because we have more than three priorities, no, but three you initiatives. In, in life, you have to, in life, you have let to me, choose. Let me start with the <laughs> seven o'clock. I, I wish everybody will be able to leave by seven o'clock. <laughs> Frequently, <laughs> it's much longer. But uh, but believe me, I'm, I'm not checking everybody to, to, to make them work uh, extra hours. I have a, a very dedicated team, and they, they, they are all workaholic. They, they all love the work. And there are so many things we can do. This is, this is one of the differences. I can see the tense smile yes. on your colleague. <laughs> He's one of them. <laughs> yes, but his smile is very artificial. You know, uh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> If you knew what his salary <laughs> and conditions are, you know. no, I think that's what uh, distinguishes the, the Mexican delegation and, and certainly myself. Uh, and, and saying this in a university with young people, I think it is it, it, particularly uh, appropriate. There is people in this world that are paid for doing what they like and what they love, and I'm one of them. I, I do my, my work uh, so happily. I wouldn't say that I would continue to do it without any pay because I don't have any other means to survive. But, but honestly, uh, there is a, a commitment on the, on the Mexican mission to, to a number of uh, initiatives that we have undertaken. And, and that's why it's difficult to, to, to highlight uh, only three. Let me go very quickly. We are a very active delegation on this armament. By tradition, we had a Nobel Prize, uh, uh, Garcia Robles, Garcia and Robles. we have ke kept pushing for total nuclear disarmament, abolition of nuclear weapons. We will continue. Right now, we are pushing for, uh, for a resolution because the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva has been unable to, to, to work for the last 15, 16 years. They have not come to any agreement. The so-called consensus rule is blocking everything. It has, to be, it has become kind of a veto on the hands of a few. So we are working very hard to, to reactivate the discussions and, and, and hopefully start negotiation. Uh, in parallel, we are also pushing very much for a new convention on, on uh, traffic uh, uh, arms trade, uh, that um, the so-called ATT, uh, arms trade treaty on which we, will, we are looking for a treaty that will uh, certainly put some limits to the trade of guns based on the destination of those guns, uh, that they, they should not be sent to areas of in conflict, that they should not send to governments which have uh, 
constantly or con violated human rights, etc. Uh, because of human rights and humanitarian considerations in general, and by doing that, we will also restrict the access of those guns or weapons to the to the criminal transnational organized crime. So that's the agenda on the first committee. Two main issues that we have right now. On the second committee, which is the economic one, I'm vice president of the Economic and Social Council, and I'm working also on the follow-up of Rio Plus 20, which is the Sustainable Development Agenda. And we have, I, 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 I will need a full conversation only on the package of uh, ECOSOC reform and the future of the balancing of the environmental, the economic, and the uh, social dimensions. All the work that the UN has been unable to do in the last few years. Uh, we have uh, to recognize that the UN has lost a lot of relevance in, in, in discussion. We face uh, recently a financial crisis and a food crisis and the UN was almost useless. Uh, that's why the G20 emerged and other processes and uh, even this is a criticism that covers to some extent also the IMF, the World Bank. So we need to reshape, or reorganize the multilateral uh, architecture uh, dealing with uh, economic issues. But it is a long agenda. Uh, as a vice president of ECOSOC, I am supposed to become the president of ECOSOC in January. So I'm working uh, for the transformation of ECOSOC, dealing in all these issues, but I'm also threatening everybody not to take the presidency. Uh, unless there is a serious effort of reform of ECOSOC, because I don't want business as usual, I don't want to be seated there just to give the floor to delegates and repeat the speeches, which, which I know by heart. Uh, so we, we, we need to look into the, the agenda and also the, the way we deal with that agenda, the methods of work, etc. I'm a quite unconventional diplomat. Uh, and, uh, and I have uh, some reasons to believe that it may work because I was in charge of the transition between the old Commission on Human Rights and the new Council for Human Rights. That transition was, I think, a successful transition. Uh, and we did it uh, on this ground of innovation, no rules of procedure, not uh, uh, fixed uh, statements or pre-cooked uh, arrangement between the, the regional groups. We did it uh, very much by, by forging, uh, forcing people to talk to each other and, and building uh, jointly uh, by, by proposals. On the third committee, since I'm already talking about human rights, we have to prepare for a, an important meeting less next year, a high-level meeting on migration, on which we will hopefully finally find a way for the issue of migration to be dealt at the UN as important as it is, not only for the bilateral relation between Mexico and the US, but, but worldwide, it is incredible to recognize or to, 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 to learn that the UN is not dealing with migration. Uh, the developed countries have opposed for the topic to be inscribed on the agenda as, a, as an independent topic. They have opposed any committee, any working group to deal with it. We only have something which, which we call the Global Forum on Migration, which is a voluntary process in which uh, governments can meet uh, once a year and, and they cannot take decisions, there is no follow-up, uh, and officially there is no link with the UN, other than a special representative of the Secretary General attending those meetings. So, so we need to deal with that. We need to take the, the, the human rights uh, approach to it, because we need to talk about the protection of migrants, but we also need to take in, uh, the, the economic aspect, the, the role that uh, remittances play, uh, for the development and how to, to make better use. And we also need to, to deal with the question of uh, security. All three dimensions dealing with migration are our focus for next year uh, discussion. We are preparing, because I have been asked by the President of the General Assembly in a very unique process that will surprise you, even, even you, Ambassador Kamal. I'm co-facilitating a process of preparation of an international conference on indigenous people's rights. And what is unique is not me working on that, because that nothing, nothing new for us. It is an important topic for Mexico, and we have done it in the past. What is interesting is that uh, uh, my co-facilitator is an indigenous representative, not a government. So an indigenous representative and a governmental rep representative are preparing for that mm -hmm. conference on which we will be able to look into the 
declaration on the rights of people with this, uh, indigenous peoples and, 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 and try to advance the agenda. In parallel, I was already jumping to it, uh, we are more or less behind the father and mother of the Convention on the Persons with Disabilities and the rights of persons with disabilities. And we have also a high level uh, the event next year on disabilities, of which we finally are getting away far from the, the, the health approach, from the paternalistic approach that has traditionally been used. And we are talking about the person with disabilities getting into, into the, the, the uh, work uh, force and getting into the exercise of their own rights, including rights of uh, reproduction, etc., on their own. That's the, the migration, uh, indigenous people, and uh, what else do we have in the committee? Uh, we have uh, uh, migrants, indigenous disabilities, and, uh, and we have uh, women. Uh, we are uh, an organized crime which is part of the third committee. In the fourth committee, which is deal, uh, dealing with, uh, among other things, with peacekeeping operation, we, have, we are going to enter into a huge battle with the U.S. But not only with the U.S., we will need to fight all P5 members, all permanent members. They have, uh, very cleverly, they have invented uh, one word, or one uh, title, which is the special political missions. Sounds very beautiful. Special political mission. What does it mean, a special political mission? It means a peacekeeping operation they don't want to finance any longer through the budget on peacekeeping. You know, the budget on peacekeeping is a budget that puts particular uh, weight or give a, a greater responsibility to the P5. Whenever you have a peacekeeping operation, most of the budget, at least 60, 70 percent of the budget, has to be paid by those five members because those are permanent members. They have veto power, etc. But through these special political missions, they find a way to finance those operations through the regular budget on which we all pay. And they are putting among those special political missions the missions in Afghanistan or in Iraq. And the amount of money we are talking about today is more than a billion dollars. So a billion and two thousand almost uh, that it is being transferred from the peacekeeping budget to the regular budget. So we are saying no more. We are not going to finance uh, on an equal footing those operations. Special responsibilities of the P5 needs to, to, to be retained. Otherwise, they can give up their veto power and their permanent seat in the Security Council, then we will pay gladly. On this fifth committee, this battle will continue because it starts on the fourth, but it will go to the fifth, and we are ready to, to, to go to a negotiation on the scale of assessment. The scale of assessment, just to give you an idea, if we use one scale or the other for a country like Mexico, that means $10 million difference. For a country like Turkey, now I just found out this afternoon, it may mean $30 million. Uh, so we are not talking about a few dollars. Lastly, on the sixth committee, the, ju the uh, juridical committee, I have been appointed as a facilitator for the rule of law, the promotion of the rule of law. We organized a high-level event in September this year. Head of state has signed and uh, approved a, a declaration, fortunately by consensus. But now we need to follow up, and, and it's a very complicated topic because it relates according to our own proposal, not only to the administration of justice, but also to development, uh, to human rights, uh, to the fight against crime, etc. So this is only the General Assembly. I'm not referring to the Security Council uh, reform or other topics that uh, we share so much, uh, Pakistan and Mexico. But uh, just for the sake of the question and answer period, uh, those are out of your priorities. Yes, but uh, you realize, Mr. Ambassador, that uh, uh, as a former president of ECOSOC, uh, I, have, I dealt with all these all problems these issues. also. Mm -hmm. And because of that, my hair, which was totally black before yeah. I became president of ECOSOC, has turned this color. Now, you your, were lucky. I your hair cannot. 
quite, quite right. Your hair cannot turn white for obvious reasons. But you understand that you are not going to succeed. I will. On any one of these. You're I not will. Going to I get, will. You are not going to get nuclear disarmament. You are not going to get a comprehensive uh, global conference on migration. You are not going to get uh, 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 ECOSOC increased mm -hmm. importance. Article 65 yeah. of the Charter has never been met. The Security Council will never allow you mm -hmm. to incre get proper importance. Indigenous people, okay, you, if you want to put on a hat with feathers mm -hmm. and play with drums, uh, it's okay. Nobody minds that. <laughs> uh, you are not going to succeed in against the permanent five. There's no way they will allow you to cut down their thing. And rule of law, good luck. So, <laughs> uh, perhaps with that so, very cheery so. note of, uh, of cynicism, we can no. turn it over to uh, and ask I, for some. I hand over with pleasure to the chairman. So, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Kamal. Right the rule of the rule of law. It's nice but to follow that. I'm going to uh, ask uh, some of our younger, perhaps more optimistic uh, people in the audience if they have some questions for this for Kamal. Questions? Please raise your hand, and we'll, somebody will come around to you with a microphone if you have a question. Alex. Right. As you know, uh, El PRI has recently come to power in Mexico again with the election of Peña Nieto. Now, last time that they were in power, they held on to power for over 70 years, and there were massacres of students and different types of abuses against freedom of speech and human rights. How do you think that their coming to power again will affect those issues, human rights and freedom of speech in Mexico? Well, I, I think it, you are right to point out that the, the PRI stay in power for too long and there is a history of uh, several uh, abuses, but, but you also have to recognize that they, 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 it's not only abuses. Uh, the, the PRI had different governments and different successes. and uh, People tend to forget, particularly now, that the PRI has been able to win the, the election, that the main shift in favor of human rights was taken before the PNA and, and win. Uh, the main changes started in 90, 98, 97, 98, three years before President Fox was elected. That was the time in which we decided to uh, enter into a, a, a negotiation with the Office of the High Commissioner to have permanent presence in Mexico. We recognized the obligatory jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. We ratified most of the pending treaties. Uh, I was personally involved into that. I can tell you because my job continued to be exactly the same three years before Fox and three years after Fox, including my own election as president of the Human Rights Council. So on human rights, I think it is important to recall that, that there are a number of people within the PRI who seriously believe in human rights, and I'm confident that they will continue uh, with that uh, tradition. I think there are a number of uh, areas on which the, the new government uh, will need to, to, to focus its attention, and, 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 and I, I, I hope that one of them is, is obviously uh, going to, 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 uh, to be not only whether we ratify or not a number of treaties and accept a number of commitments, but whether we do more work at the local level. And, uh, and I think that's one of the pending uh, areas. We just had a constitutional reform that uh, uh, incorporated all human rights treaties into our laws. Now we need to make sure that every single state abides by that uh, constitutional amendment, that the tribunals and everyone will make full use. So there is a huge... Uh, um, package of, of uh, things that need to be done by the new administration, but it is mainly national. So don't don't expect big new initiatives. There are not many. The only new initiative on which we are working, and it may be supported by the PRI, uh, it will certainly be supported, is a new initiative for a, a new convention on the rights of uh, um, how we call that adultos mayores, elder elderly. We yes, the aged. Aging. That's the only new initiative which is on, on the table, but, but, but you will see a lot at the national, at the internal level, I, I hope. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, what uh, are your views regarding uh, economic development? Now we're, we have this uh, sustainable development, but whether it's sustainable or unsustainable, there, there are people that are very poor that need immediate attention. Um, why isn't that? I, I, I saw a number of priorities, but that didn't come up as a number one. Um, mm -hmm. Could you explain a little bit more as to what specifically you, you, your mission does at the United Nations, and how mm -hmm. can you help this process? Mm -hmm. Well, I before coming to New York uh, one year ago, I was uh, for the last the two years before I was a special envoy of uh, my government to, to, to negotiate and to deal with climate change. We, I prepared for the conference in, in Cancun and the concept of sustainable development is very much uh, a concept that we, we, we promote and we support. The problem with sustainable development for, for a lot of people is that they have assimilated the concept with the environment and, and uh, we are not very happy with it. We are working particularly on a, the, what we consider the correct interpretation of sustainable development, which is the balancing of the environmental, the economic and the social aspects. And therefore, we, uh, before Rio, we organized a number of, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting story, but a little bit long, I make it short. The process of negotiation in preparing for Rio, making a revision after 20 years after the first uh, conference, uh, was extremely deficient. Uh, one of those very f normal processes at the UN. Huge uh, room, screens, big repetitive desk, text, uh, everybody was uh, like a, with a Christmas tree hanging something. So I decided not to go to that process or through that process and I organized a number of consultations uh, uh, at my mission. It came to a point on which my mission was too small and then we moved into the Indonesian mission and we produced a number of papers. And the main, to, to go to your question, what are we promoting? First is the first forum for sustainable development uh, that should take place, the first meeting should take place next year. Our intention is to deal with sustainable development differently. We will put an end to the Commission on Sustainable Development. It will not meet again, probably once uh, next year, just to close. But it, we will abandon the Commission because it has become uh, inappropriate and has not delivered. And for me, the new forum is going to be most likely what uh, Ambassador Kamal is telling me that I may not be successful in achieving, which is the reform of ECOSOC. I see ECOSOC as the Council for Sustainable Development, the, the entity which is going to be able to integrate all three pillars. But in order to do that, you need to have a number of conditions. The first one is a good understanding that we are not talking only about the environment, that if we talk about the energy, water, etc., it has to go with, together with health and, and, and poverty and all the other goals on development. Second, that we do not have either the, the knowledge, not the authority, to take decisions in New York on a number of issues. That uh, unless we get the right people around the table, it will never work. We need people from the finance sector to come to New York, not only to Washington. If they do not sit and take the part of the decision, decisions on financing for development will continue to be just rhetoric. Uh, we also need to, to rebalance the agenda with the social participation. We need ministers of trade, etc. We need civil society within ECOSOC. Uh, private sector is going to be responsible of a large, uh, to a large extent, of the, the success in fighting climate change. Just to mention one example, we have a goal of uh, reaching a hundred billion dollars by year that will be used only for climate change. Half of that money, at least half, if not more, needs to come from private sources. There is no public fi financing that will be uh, possible to, 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 to get uh, at that level. So if we have the right actors around the table and the right balances in the agenda, this forum can make the difference. But once for all, the UN should uh, accept, and that, that includes governments and the Secretariat. They need to understand that the UN has some comparative advantages, and one of them is the capacity to convene 
and the legitimacy of the universal participation, etc. But it doesn't mean that we can take decisions on behalf of all others. We cannot take decisions on behalf of the World Bank. I cannot take decisions on behalf of the Minister of Finance. And it means also that we do we, we, we value the, the knowledge and the, the, the understanding of the different sectors and, and actors. And we do not pretend to, to, to be the, on the name of universality and democracy, uh, the place on which everything is solved, and even less in a plenary meeting. The longer we continue to deal with these issues in a hall with 193 representatives, the longer we will maintain a process of speeches and, and nothing else but the speeches. Uh, we need to change that. Thank you. Another question? Sorry, can I just, maybe we can give a student a chance? Uh, maybe Brianna in the front and then Brittany. Ambassador, um, the newly elected president seems to be favoring big business, especially with his new reform laws, and he says that they will aid everyday Americans, uh, everyday Mexicans. Do you find this to be true, especially after seeing um, America's big financial crisis because of corruption and big business in America and the everyday struggle? Sorry, could, could you repeat? I didn't get they They will do what to Mexicans? Um, the newly elected president yeah. seems to be saying a lot of things and making statements that we favor big business and mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. And um, he says, it seems to be saying they will aid everyday Americans, um, mm -hmm. everyday Mexicans. Mm -hmm. Find this to be true, especially after what happened in America. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I think the new president is, is, is repeating to a large extent uh, things that have been said by, by President Calderon. But there are a number of reforms which have not been possible to achieve in Mexico because of the division in Congress. So I, I, I think there is a kind of an emerging consensus that the country needs some reforms, and those reforms are absolutely needed for the country to be able to, to grow at a faster speed. How you do it is, is, is something else, and then you have to deal with each of the reforms. We start with the reform of the... the uh, the trabajo, the work, the labor uh, law, and it will go to the to the fiscal uh, reform, and it may uh, certainly touch on issues on how we deal with uh, the oil company, etc. And and then you can have the nuances between different approaches. But I, I think the the, the the point of com of convergence is that we all realize, all Mexicans, we, uh, I think we are uh, that we are not doing bad because the, the economy has mm -hmm. continued to grow, but we should be doing much better. And, 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 and we cannot just continue with the toe grow of on the, on the, on the four, 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 and a, four and a half. Uh, participation of uh, private sector, I think it is a tendency at the global level. We need to recognize that a different relationship uh, needs to be established, but we have gone from the denial to the to the of the, the need of the, the private sector to the to the uh, putting the, the private sector as as the only solution or the solution and both extremes are wrong. International cooperation and, and efforts, uh, uh, particularly when we look at the international level, not at the national, will need to identify the role of each of the players, and. Uh, International assistance has to continue to play a role for a number of country, uh, countries. Uh, transfer of techn technologies need to continue, etc. So, so there are different pieces. I, I wouldn't say that the PRI is going to be closer to the private sector in Mexico than, than, than the actual government. Uh, I hope that we will be able to develop a different relationship that will make much more will build on a, on a partnership on, on a number of areas, especially to invest on technology. Maybe we have, I think we have time for just one more question, unfortunately. I think uh, the Republicans on the right wing have asked too many questions. What about the Democrats? The Democrats. The I don't wing? see any arms over there. Are there? Th okay. There's one arm about here, you? Yes. <laughs> uh, Good evening, Ambassador. I was just wondering if you had the opportunity to change or alter the United States foreign policy, how would you alter in, in order to create a stronger and long-term relationship between the U.S. and Mexico? 
Well, my job is to try to change their minds on a daily basis, and sometimes <laughs> I succeed. I have been declared uh, declare persona non grata at one moment, uh, <laughs> dealing with the Human Rights Council. Uh, I was, uh, you can check the Congress, and then they were talking about whether I should ever be able to, to get into the US again. Uh, and I have some friends. So I try to influence both ways by uh, fighting them on issues on which I think they are wrong. Human rights is one of the examples. They recognize today what has been done in the Human Rights Council. They are not only members of the Human Rights Council, they, they even praise the, the institutional package uh, we were able to build. So this is one way of influence. And the other one is by, by helping them to understand a number of processes and, and to involve them. The, the, the U.S. has a number of values which we, we share. And uh, we, we need to make sure that uh, the, the U.S. policy is a, 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 a reflection of those values and not only international strategy or uh, concerns as a superpower. The U.S. sometimes has to follow its own beliefs. And it doesn't make any sense uh, for the U.S. not to be part of the criminal court, for instance. We are putting pressure on them to, to be part of that process only because they fear that some peacekeeping operate, uh, uh, personnel may be subject to an unjust fair uh, trial somewhere. doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that they are uh, so, so um, against a number of uh, initiatives coming to the bilateral agenda on migration. We are making a bigger effort. Uh, but I would say, generally speaking, uh, that uh, the U.S. has much more respect for Mexico than the one you could imagine when it comes to international issues. Uh, and and uh, that's something which is not very well known in the, the, uh, the, 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 the public level, uh, but it is well known in the U.S. So we also play a role in some cases on which not only we are able to advise the Americans or to help them, but also to other countries to understand the Americans and to, to teach them how to deal with the Americans so that the Americans are part of a deal at the end. We have been able, just let me give you one of the example, one of those impossible tasks, tasks at the UN. Uh, immediately after September 11, I was asked by my government, one person in my government, which happens to be a former uh, NGO, uh, a newly appointed official by, by the Fox administration, uh, she, I was asked to present a resolution at the UN immediately after September 11, a few months later, or weeks later, on the need to protect human rights in the fight against terrorism. Uh, the resolution uh, was opposed, obviously, by the U.S. strongly, but not only by the U.S., by the, the Chinese and by the Indians and by the Russians and by the Algerians, because of different reasons, but, uh, but it was to remind people that even in fighting terrorism, you need to respect the rule of law, you need to respect uh, the, the, the human rights in general. And everybody told me, don't even try to get that resolution, uh, uh, because it will never pass. You will never get uh, the necessary majority, or at least a, a significant majority, and certainly ever, never a consensus and the resolution was passed by consensus. That resolution didn't pass immediately. We had to work and accommodate, and it passed on 2002, but with the approval of the United States. And a few years later, one or two years later, we were able, with the approval of the US, to appoint a, a special uh, rapporteur to report on practices and activities on that field, and, and we were able to have a debate and a discussion on the situation of detention, including Guantanamo. So this is the way we, we can work at the UN. Uh, it doesn't happen every day, it's not easy, but... Um, and the US, uh, the only message we, we send constantly is that they need to wait before they react. They need to be more, uh, I would say, more uh, 
prudent or less uh, authoritarian and, and they need to, to, to listen and, and, and the more they listen, the more they allow people in the middle to come with ideas, the easier it goes. Because if the US raised its voice on any topic, immediately you get the opposition on the other and then a silent majority will prevail. The sense of the common sense, the good ideas, the moderate approaches will never be even presented because the majority, the large majority, will keep silent. So allowing these cross-regional dialogues, uh, allowing countries in the middle to build the bridges is what, uh, what helps the most the U.S. to remain a superpower. Well, on that note of prudence and pragmatism, if not outright optimism, <laughs> with this uh, UN Pathways event we draw to a close. Before we depart, I'd like to thank uh, the two main co-sponsors for this event, the Provost's office, Pro uh, Professor and Provost Woolley, Brian Morrow and Susan Durkin in that office, and then the Office of uh, Global Learning, Joanne Murphy, Sarah Horn, um, our, uh, all the student uh, interns that help uh, make, this, make this happen. Uh, but most of all, I'd like to thank Ambassadors uh, uh, Kamal and Gongora for taking time out of what I know are very busy schedules late in the evening to, to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.